Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Joe. I was saying the other day there seems to be more fires in homes than there once was. Yeah, I know what you mean. I've wondered if that's because we're seeing it more on the news, so it seems like there's mm. more fires. Yeah. But whatever the reason or if that's in fact the case, the fact is most accidental house fires are caused by what they call an unattended heat source. And I can't even begin to imagine how many properties and lives have been saved because of smoke detectors. Mm. Yeah, it's National Burns Awareness Month, so your attention does turn to the thousands of Australians who suffer burns each year. In fact, it's around 200,000 people, and Rach, thankfully, most of those burns are at the minor end. Exactly. We actually had an incident uh, when Viola was two where she put her foot into a hot, boiling hot cup of tea. Oh. She, she had a sock on as well, so it took her a while to actually register the heat source. Yeah. Um, and we spent the next six to eight weeks going in and out of hospital, getting the dressings changed. Wow. And that was probably one of the hardest things, the hardest parts of my parenting so far. And I can't imagine what it's like for a severe case of a burn, like just well, the... Well, it's interesting you should say that. Severe cases are when 20% or over 20% of your total body surface area are burnt, and that makes up for about 8% of the total cases. Now, interestingly, younger people and older people are most at risk, and that comes to water, which mm. is just too hot. Oh. And then unattended appliances is also in there as well. And also accelerant fires, which is really serious stuff. Mm. Now, whatever the cause, some people are unfortunate enough to suffer severe burns and the road back is tough, both physically and psychologically. On New Year's Day three years ago, motorbike enthusiast Terry was riding along a mountain road. All of a sudden, car came around the corner and it had nothing to do but clip him. And it, I had about two seconds warning. I held on and hit his wheel glanced off his wheel and bounced back into the curb. But I broke the fuel tank with my body and fuel was all over me. And uh, then it went bang. And off I went and I burnt for a minute and a half probably. And I looked down at my hands and it was all droopy skin, you know, flopping off the bottom of them. And I lay on the ground and then it was a case of breathing. For an hour I just tried to breathe. I thought I've got to keep breathing. If I stop breathing I'll die here. 60-year-old Terry was transported to the Alfred Hospital with 35% full thickness burns to his hands, arms, stomach, neck and legs and was given a 5% chance of survival. 50 years ago I would have died in the hospital without the modern technology they offered me. The nursing they gave me was fantastic. Without them I wouldn't have survived. After a week in intensive care, Terry was moved to the burns unit. Full thickness burns aren't so. I didn't know this at the time, but because you lose all your nerve endings, they're not painful at all. What was painful is where they pull all the skin off to redo the burns, and they strip skin off every part of my body that wasn't burnt. My whole back, they peeled the skin off, it was bright red, like the worst sunburn you've ever had. Went for three weeks and it was really painful. These are the sort of scarring you have to deal with. They had to repair that area and they used skin from other parts of me where I hadn't been burnt and that, that leaves keloid scars which are very itchy. That skin is then cut up into little blocks with mesh on it to stretch it and placed over other areas where I need skin. You end up with that result which is a little bit numb but perfect right, holds the blood in and keeps the dirt out. Terry underwent over 10 surgeries with the most major being the amputation of his fingers. So I sort of kissed them goodbye and then they did the operation and that was a bit of a moment. I looked at them and thought, oh, well, must have been new hands. Better than it could have been. And I was a lucky bloke because my injuries were getting better every day. And that makes a big difference to your psyche. Terry stayed in the burns unit for nearly three months. I seem to have a lot of family come and visit. And as good as the hospital is, you still need family to come in and feed you occasionally because they'll bring food in, but my hands are wrapped up and the nurses haven't got time. And I'm looking at the food going, well, I suppose I could throw my face at it and get some, but having my sister and my brother-in-law and my partner to come in and feed me. But I, I wished I hadn't have done that to them. I'm glad me dad and mum didn't see it. That I wouldn't have liked. And I wish my kids hadn't have seen it, but it's the way it is. And they've been fantastic. And they all grew up very quickly, I must say, especially my young boy. He grew up in four hours. Yeah. Terry decided that he would not let his injuries hold him back and started to restore his beloved aeroplane. 
I couldn't really use my fingers for about a year, year and a half. They're too sore. I could do odd jobs, but doing up shoelaces was just hard work. But it's been the last year I've been able to get back to work more. But that's all right. It slows me down a little bit, but not too much. And I use a pair of pliers occasionally, and I drop nuts occasionally. And four or five times I do it to get the nut on sometimes. And since his accident, Terry is back doing all his favourite hobbies. I do scuba diving, I fly aeroplanes, I ride motorbikes, and in all those sports, you are not looking back. You are looking forward to the next five seconds. The bit behind you is irrelevant, and I'm living my life like that. There's no point looking back. It's done. I don't need to go there. That's just the way I am, and I can imagine it's not the same for everybody. What an incredibly courageous man. And I love that outlook from Terry, always looking forward. Mm. No point in looking back. Mm. I, that is so inspirational. We could all take a leaf out of that book. I think mm. we've all complained about things which really, in the end of the day, do not matter. Mm. I felt really emotional watching that mm. because his energy and his resolve was incredibly inspiring. Yeah, and how beautiful to see that support and that connection from his family, from the community around him. I mean, it's just... I had goosebumps. Yeah. Mm. It's, and the work that the nurses and the people do that bring him back to health and back to life. I mean, you've got to have the courage to do what he did, but uh, they're incredible. Day to day, dealing with people in that situation, you, you, you can't thank those people enough, can you? No, absolutely. absolutely. So lovely. Yeah, Terry mentioned the incredible work done by the staff at the Alfred Hospital. They are special people. You'll meet one of them right after this. Before the break, we heard Terry's incredible story of pain and survival after a horrific motorbike accident. He was treated at Melbourne's Alfred Hospital and as part of Burns Awareness Month, I visited their Burns unit to get a glimpse of what they do. Dr Heather Cleland is a renowned plastic surgeon and head of the Burns unit here at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. This is the Burns Unit, it's a statewide service for Victoria and we admit virtually all of the patients who are burnt in Victoria who sustain a severe burn. We also see a lot of people with less severe burns for various treatments but you know the key reason for our existence is these people with the, the most severe injuries. One of those patients is 59-year-old Philip, who was admitted to the hospital four days ago after throwing accelerant on a fire. So there was a question about whether um, Philip had had an inhalation injury where you inhale so hot flames and... Into your face. Yeah. And um, if that happens, sometimes your airway can swell some hours after the event just okay. with the response. So, yeah. so with, there was some burning in my nose, but it didn't go down my airway. So he, yeah. You're mighty lucky there's no damage to those airways. That's, um... I, I'm very lucky. Yep. Yeah. I'm very lucky. Philip's got a long road ahead of him. He'll spend the next part of his recovery here in the treatment area, where all the rooms are individually heated. Because uh, your temperature regulation is shot when you have an extensive burn, as you can imagine, and that's really to stop their body temperature dropping precipitously when they have those extensive procedures and when they're in the bath. The bath is a crucial step in the treatment process. This is the bathroom. OK. The traditional treatment for burns patients, really, for, for many years since the Second World War, was to regularly bath them, um, you know, day after day, week after week, until all of the burnt tissue sort of floated off in the bath. And then you had sort of raw areas that then were skin grafted. Modern burn treatment, um, we still use these baths, but we don't use them as a debridement mechanism. We operate early, we actively cover the wounds with various bioengineered skin substitutes or else skin graft them straight away. And then once the grafts are taken and their donor sites are healing, we get them in the shower or the bath and just help to clean everything up. So if we're not using these baths in the initial treatment, what's the process? Well, the, the initial uh, wound management depends very much on how deep the burn is. Um, sometimes if, if a patient's got a very extensive superficial burn, we'll take them to the operating theatre and uh, give them a good scrub. Yep. And then we would put a temporary skin substitute on that will replace that very superficial barrier layer of the skin that's lost. Okay. And then the wound will heal up underneath and that superficial 
nylon silicon skin engineered product will lift off and the wound will be healed underneath. It's not every day that the Burns unit opens its doors, so I feel really, really privileged to have seen just a small part of the incredible work that they do there. And I'm really, really pleased to welcome here today to the show Burns nurse Hannah Menzies and acting commander of the CFA, Andrew Smith. Welcome. Now, Hannah, when I was having a tour around the Alfred, I noticed that the patients were kept in their room, but then a lot of the treatments were happening elsewhere. Can you explain why that separation is so important? Yeah, it's... Um, the patient's room sort of considered a safe haven, a place that they can go back to and rest. So dressings, procedures and often therapy are done away from mm. that area. OK. Yeah. And it gives them that peace of mind, doesn't it? Yeah. Where they can associate their room with peace and quiet yep. and anything else that might be quite traumatic is elsewhere. That's right. And I can't believe the remarkable work you do. I found that really confronting, to be honest with you, watching that, uh, that, that bit of vision. What are some of the, the worst examples you've had to deal with? You've been doing it for 13 years. Yeah, I've been around burns for, well, nearly 20. Yeah. I worked in intensive care before and that's how I got my exposure to burns patients. It's not the size of injury for me, it's about the individual. Every patient's different. You know, that impact that it has on you as, as a person yeah. is sort of where it's at for me. And my job, I know I'll be done when it doesn't affect me in yeah. that way. Yeah. It's that sort of personal impact that really touches your yeah. heart. Hannah, I noticed that you can take about, or there's an average of nine patients in there at any one time. Yep. Can you tell me what some of the most common treatments are and what most of the common things that you're seeing in there? Yeah, in terms of injury types? Yeah. So 60% of our patients have flame-related injury and of that 60%, 88 of those are young men. So significant number of our patients, unfortunately, are males. Mm. Um, we do... Often dressings, procedures, wound care, skin grafting, operating, it, it's quite variable depending on how big the burn is and what sort of treatment's needed. We're seeing a lot of those developments now in skin grafting and new skin technology. Mm. What are some of the things being used now than, say, 10 years ago were unheard of? Yeah, so biological dressings and bioengineered skin substitutes are the They big... can mimic the skin. Yeah, they that... can. Mm. Yeah. We've got um, a a substitute that we're using at the moment that's purely polyurethane mm. and there's no sort of biological component to that. Okay. Um, so there's all sorts of different ranges of skin substitutes that we use. One of them's a pig collagen based skin mm. substitute. So it acts like a biological dressing and covers the wounds, dampens the pain response, improves healing times, mm. gets people out of hospital quicker, mm. minimises risk of infection. And Andrew, you respond to house fires and well, yep. so much more than that. Mm. Uh, and so you're there right first response when yep. someone has been burned, which I, I imagine is the crucial moment for them. How yep. do you treat them while <coughs> you're waiting for the ambulance? Basically, it's no different than any normal first aid person would get. Um, the education on. We'd um, treat them with water, um, cold running water for um, 20 minutes. But the, the main thing is um, the when we add when we use the cold water on them, we're actually lowering their person's core body temperature. Mm. So we, we treat the patient by cooling the burn and warming the patient until the ambulance arrive and then they can give um, further pain relief if that's required. I imagine there's a huge need for comfort for that person there at that is. time. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, because they're, they're in shock yes. and um, they don't know what's going on. They could be in a lot of pain um, and we can only do so much until the ambulance arrive. Right. Yeah. Um, and now the CFA is yep. working for the, with the Royal Children's Hospital and the right. Alfred <clears throat> Hospital as well with a yep. preventative program. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's called the Victoria Victorian Burns Prevention Partnership. It started in about 2004 and uh, we've been working together and it's a bit unique. Um, we were looking for some data in relation to people we were missing in the community and we realised that there was a number of people getting burnt, particularly flame related, from the um, Alfred Hospital. So it was a way of bringing the um, hospitals and the emergency services together mm. to um, work on a burn prevention um, message out there to mm -hmm. stop all the, the people getting burnt and um, stop them going to the output, basically yeah. putting um, Hannah out of a job. Mm. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah. Coming back to you, Hannah, we yeah. hear the term first, second, third degree burns yeah. a lot. Can you actually explain what, what that means? I can, and it's often sort of a misunderstood terminology. 
In the States, they name it first, second, third degree. In Australia, we tend to name the layer of the skin that's been mm -hmm. damaged. So epidermal burns are your true sort of sunburns. They're quite dry. And then you move into the dermal burns. And depending on which layer of the dermis has been damaged, depends on whether you need skin grafts, which is sort of like the ultimate gold standard surgery of skin replacement. Mm -hmm. Andrew, can I ask, we were talking earlier about unattended home appliances. Obviously, that's playing a huge part. Are we doing enough when it comes to fire safety and what more could we be doing? Just making sure that obviously smoke detectors have been a big um, asset to us in the community and making sure that they work properly. Yeah. Um, and also uh, cooking is in the, or kitchens are a main source of where fires start. So making sure we haven't got unattended cooking um, and we, we know what to do and making sure that we've got a smoke detector, making sure that we've got fire blankets and a fire extinguisher in our home. Uh, and if uh, you are cooking with oil, and we're hoping people don't, but if they are cooking with oil and it does catch fire, we, we encourage people not to pick the um, hot uh, pot up that's mm, on fire yeah. and try and take it outside okay, and to see the result yeah. of that um, at the hospital. Andrew, Hannah, thanks so much for joining us in the House of Wellness and for the incredible life-saving work that you both do. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.